CORRECTIONS! Several issues ago, Wes and Chris had this back and forth while Wes was kidnapping Sarah from her wedding, and I thought it was complete nonsense. It was pointed out to me that it's actually a reference to Scooby-Doo. Applecore! Baltimore! Who is your friend? Me! It still makes no sense. Also, these blue stripes are the straps of Chris's backpack. I said his shirt changed pattern, but really he just took his backpack off, although this was not depicted in the comic. December 2008 There are a lot of characters in this comic now. Some introduced at strange times, and others brought up once and never mentioned again. There are backstories and egresses only understandable to those following Chris's personal life. But even though that's a complaint and a negative aspect of the series, there is something really cool about this cover featuring all of the Sonic Shoes and Rose Shoes in battle poses. Even Bionic is dunking a basketball. Episode 19, Date Ed, aka Dating Education, even though the idea sounds dated. That's supposed to be a pun. Wild and Punchy are walking through the halls of Quickville University, discussing the dating class they're going to take. Unfortunately, this issue is handwritten by Chris instead of typed, which makes it lose some of its charm and legibility. The university is also a high school for some reason, and Zapina, the 14-year-old Rose Jew, is there. Her babysitter tells her to find a good 16-year-old boy for some reason. So they all go to class, taught by Miss Jackarass, and she gives a long speech. This is the problem with Chris handwriting the comic, he crosses out words and takes up significantly more space than he actually needs. So Mrs. Jackarass tells them that they will be secretly paired with members of the opposite sex, excluding herself, both because it would be illegal and because she's dating a cowboy, and they should practice dating one another and use the tips that they learn in class. The teacher, Sarah Jackarass, is based on the person, Sarah Jackson, who was featured in the previous issue who Chris described as being hit by a car. She was a troll in real life that Chris believed was his actual sweetheart, and this character is a tribute to her. She then says that they should start as friends and eventually move on to being a couple, meaning that Chris's ideal high school date ed class would just assign you a partner at random. She also passes out dolls. It's unclear if they're supposed to practice talking to these dolls to get over the fear of the opposite gender or if they're sex dolls. I'm going to assume the former, especially since they're referred to as Barbara and Robert dolls, which are the names of Chris's parents. During Roll Call, we're introduced to Ivy and Reginald who will become important soon. Reginald is a Sneasel, even though this is the worst attempt at drawing a Sneasel I have ever seen. The class is mostly populated by South Park characters, with Wendy and Cartman very recognizable. As the class is sitting down, nervously waiting for the pairings, the camera zooms in on Ivy's eyes, and we see Chris Chan floating inside them. Then we see Chris with Ivy inside his eye. Chris then gets a vision from God and Jesus that he and Ivy are destined to be together. Before we continue, I must address a special issue of Sonic that Chris drew. Ivy is a real person. Well, Ivy is actually not a real person. She's a troll pretending to be Chris's girlfriend, again. But Chris drew a special issue of Sonic for her in which he saves her from the villainous Clyde Cash. Sometime during the writing of the last issue of Sonic Chris said that he didn't want to actually finish the comic so a troll pretending to be a teenage boy named Ryan said he would commit suicide unless Chris drew more. Chris refused to do so, and so the boy, Ryan, died. Clyde Cash is Ryan's brother, and various trolls would use Clyde's identity to troll Chris over the years. This panel down here is from the end of that comic that he drew specifically for Ivy, although its canonicity is unknown, as Chris would be in the void at this point and be unable to save her. The pairings then get announced, and Reginald, who looks more like a Digimon than a Sneasel, is upset that he didn't get the pairing he wanted. He wanted to be with a Flappy named Layla, but she's Punchy's partner. We get to see Chris's amazing writing skills as he places Ivy in this class only for her to refuse to participate because she wants to date Chris. Reginald sees Punchy buying a soda and gets mad that he's paired with Layla instead of him. His rage builds, and the next day, the class is separated onto opposite sides of the room by gender so that pairs will remain anonymous. There's a montage of Punchy and Layla getting to know each other better, and Reginald getting more and more jealous. And yes, Chris literally calls it a montage. The next day in class, Punchy and Layla are getting more serious, making plans for a real-world date. Reginald sneaks under the table and cuts the wires to Wilde's computer, so he can't type anymore. 
Layla asks if he wants to meet up with her, and Punchy gets upset that he can't respond. He asks Wild to go tell Layla that he really does want to go on a date, but he's unable to type it. So Wild walks over to Layla and tells her that Punchy accepts the date. Then he sees that Simonla is the person he's been messaging with, and the two instantly fall in love. They go home together, and there's a bunch of diagrams of the houses because Chris is a bad storyteller. Punchy and Layla ride on a motorcycle to go to McDonald's and order a salad. Punchy feeds her with his fork, and we get this shot. Reginald is upset that he didn't get a date, and Angelica comes down to keep him company. Angelica tells Reginald he should learn the lesson to ask someone out before it's too late. Then, Reginald asks Angelica out, and she says yes. All the couples watch the sunset together, all except Ivy, who sadly awaits Chris's return. Then the day of the final exam comes. They have a new teacher, Rita, Sarah's sister. Sarah died in a car accident, so she's the teacher now for no reason. This is because Chris thinks that the real Sarah Jackson did actually die in a car crash. Here's the best word bubble in the entire series. Good morning. I, Rita Jackarass, Sarah's sister, sob, sorry, sis recently passed in automobile accident with truck. Chris did not even attempt to use proper grammar. It's possible that Chris is attempting to have her have an accent, but sis tell me a lot about you all. Or it's also possible that he ran out of space in the word bubbles. The students get their grade after individually tooing them with Punchy being the only 100, but Ivy gets a 99 despite not actually doing anything in the class because she was waiting for Chris. A character named Clyde gets a 65, the lowest grade out of the bunch. Then Chris finishes the episode with a copy of the test they took, and invites people to send him their answers for him to grade. The test has to be seen to be believed. About blank percent of regular girls ditch boys, and blank percent of pretty girls ditch boys. The answers are 10 and 100, 50 50, 73 and 98, or 75 and 13. The answer, according to Chris, is 73 and 98. If 98% of pretty girls ditch boys, then how are they in relationships, Chris? Wouldn't they all be single? How does that fit in with the infinitely high boyfriend factor? It doesn't, you're dumb. Which characteristic attracts the opposite gender the best? Class clown, full show off, Silent types, or none of the above. The question is formatted with which of the following does X the best, and Chris says that the correct answer is none of the above, and that is not possible. None of the above cannot be the best of the options. When is an appropriate time to ask for a phone number? Up front, middle of conversation, or end of enjoyable conversation? Chris says it's the third one, obviously. Boys can be like magnets, and girls like metal, when the boy is confident, honest, and smart. True or false? Chris says this one's true, but I'm not sure why he has the weird magnet metaphor. When there should be a girl for every boy, all people of your opposite gender is already taken by some other dude or gal. True or false? This is a pretty hard question to parse what he actually means, but I think he's saying that if there is someone for everybody else, then is it true that everyone of the opposite gender is taken? Based on the infinitely high boyfriend factor, you'd think that Chris would agree with this statement, but apparently the correct answer is that it's false. If the relationship or crush doesn't work out, you worry, move on, cry and pout, none of the above. Chris says that the correct answer is move on. How should you approach the person of your opposite gender if you are really shy? As a friend first, run away. If we run away, Chris, then how are we actually approaching them? That does not make any sense. With hanky in mind, hanky being sex, send someone else. Based on what happens in this comic, which is that Punchy asks Wild to ask a girl out for him, and it goes well, and then they immediately start dating, you'd think that that's the right answer, but no. Chris says that the right answer is A, as a friend. If they give you a wrong number, try harder on that person. True or false? And Chris says that it's false. To keep your girl guy liking you, you should keep clean, act normal, show off a skill, or all of the above. Chris says that it's all of the above. Then the essay question says to make a 10-step approach to walking up to and talking to people of the opposite gender. Chris wrote this on April 11th, 2009. I don't know why he includes that detail, but it's neat that we have that as a part of history. So the next page needs a little bit of explanation. Some trolls claimed that Billy Mays was the mayor of Quickville, and of course other people went along with the joke, and Chris didn't realize that it was a joke and felt the need to set the record straight. They actually made Chris make a video declaring Billy Mays was the mayor by threatening him. 
So now Chris is adding a page into Sonic 2 canon, saying that Billy Mays is not the mayor. Hi, Billy Mays here! Allison, the secretary, was also the vice mayor, and now is mayor in Chris's absence. Billy Mays tells people to respect Quickville and Chris. I really don't know if Chris thinks we're all going to listen to him just because he's Billy Mays. Chris writes, I'll see you at the next Dogwood Festival, which is a local festival where Billy Mays goes to in Virginia. But unfortunately, Chris would never see Billy Mays at the Dogwood Festival again because he died two months later. Rest in peace. Next, we get a very long cold open for episode 20. A whooshing sound awakes Wild Sonichu, Punchy and Angelica roast you from their beds. Punchy apparently likes to drink a lot, and his girlfriend thinks the sound is wired. The sounds were Sylvana, Wesley, and Nate Cirk running toward the city. Chris was told by his readers that it would be unlikely that he could get Sonichu published if he used the names of real people in his stories, so occasionally you'll see alternate names for characters, like him calling Mary Lee Walsh Slawil Ryam, which is Mary Lee Walsh backward, or changing Wes's name to Walter Grisby. We cut to Sonichu and Rose Chu's house, where Rose Chu is doing laundry, and Sonichu gets to look at her camel toe for literally no reason. Rosie approaches him admiring her, and then Sonichu gives the bad news that some of their homosexual fans have been drawing Sonichu and the others in gay relationships. He says he appreciates having homosexual fans, but that he is straight. Sonichu's eyes burn as he says he's upset at being called a homo. What really grinds my gears is that homosexuals have misunderstood parts to all of the comic series heavily wrong. Contrary to their individual perceptions, all of our comics, drawings, and words were never ever meant of anything homosexual whatsoever. We promote being straight, no question or shadow of a doubt. We all, and Christian, do not appreciate at all being wrongfully mislabeled as homos. It really infuriates me. We are all straight in and around the world of Quickville, Virginia, USA. We promote being straight. I, Sonichu, you, Rosechu, our true creator, Christopher Christian Ricardo Weston Chandler of Rockersville, Virginia. We are all straight. Sonichu then smashes a potted plant. <sighs> then we get an author's note from Chris. I am straight. Do not label me otherwise. I would rather suffer a painful gender change surgery than ever be a homo. This is, of course, amazing, unintentional foreshadowing to things to come. Sonichu and Rose Chu prepare to have sex noting that the children are outside playing, despite us never having been told before now that they have children. But before they can do anything, they hear an explosion from outside and decide to go and save the day. The existence of their children means that months, if not years, have passed since Chris entered the Void, which I think is a fitting punishment for him, but it also means the villains have been plotting ever since his disappearance and are only now jumping into action. I'm glad we skipped Rose Chu's pregnancy, to be honest. Haha, <laughs> wouldn't it be terrible to see Chris drawing a bloated Rose Chu? Allison, the city's acting mayor, gets a call about the destruction, and presses a button to call in the police force, the Power Rangers, and a pizza. She has a PlayStation on her desk as well. A blue, pink, and green Power Ranger then all rush into action, and we cut to Punchy Sonichu fighting some jerk-offs. <laughs> After all this, we finally get the title card, Episode 20, Quick Defense. Wild Sonichu and his girlfriend stop a group of oncoming jerk-offs in the woods. At the church, Reginald slices a car in half, and slits the throat of a Transformer. Another Transformer appears and shoots an energy beam at Reginald, who hits it back at the robot, killing it too. Angelica cuts some jets apart in the air, and admires the destruction and death she caused around the church. Bubbles and Blake combine their water and electric attacks to destroy more cars, and the battle continues. I like this attempt to censor the robot cursing when Blake punts its head, and then there's this amazing panel, True artistic genius. Blake runs so fast past a Transformer's gun, and he makes the gun do a 180, and the robot shoots itself. <laughs> then, Blake and Bubbles kiss. In the heart of the city, Sonichu and Rosechu begin to fight the robots. Keep in mind, Chris spoiled this battle two issues ago by saying that Sonichu would win. Patty and Zapina join in the fight in the mayor's office, Patty is using magic to make a shield around the mall, and Darkbind takes out some Jerkops. Even DJ is here for half a panel, punching some Jerkops. Magichan is downing jets with his psychic powers when he's stopped by Sylvana Rosechu. Magichan tells Sylvana that he can turn her good again and return her to her birth gender, but Sylvana says that she is afraid of change. Magichan has no choice but to fight her. 
Mary Lee Walsh has been prevented from joining the battle because she has to fly around jets and a megazord on her broomstick. Wes reports that they can't enter the mall because of a force field, and only Mary Lee Walsh's magic can break it. Sonichu defeats a group of jerk ops in the main city, but the Transformers are giving him a hard time. Suddenly, and randomly, Chris's car, driven by an inexplicable hologram of Chris, arrives, and it turns into an Autobot Sonichu called Sunchu. Then we get a roll call of other good Sonichu Transformers. Prowler. Bumble Wumba. I can't read this one. Armor Axe. A Transformer grabs Rose Chu and transforms back into a car, speeding away with her, much to Sonichu's terror. Meanwhile, a building is burning down, and a woman is trapped inside, trying to free her Pokemon. She tosses her Pokemon out the window and then dies. The Pokemon are released in the street, and they are two new Sonichu, Chloe Rose Chu and Blaze Bob Sonichu. Their trainer was Sarah McKenzie, the girl Chris chose as his sweetheart at the end of the last issue, also known as Panda Halo. They cry as they realize their master has succumbed to the flames. Chris dedicates the page to her, as he believes her to have died in the 2009 Australian brush fires for literally no reason. He knew she was from Australia, and then the fires happened, and she stopped talking to him, so he concluded that she died in the fires. And then he names her Sonichu Blaze Bob. Inspired by her death, the Sonichu and Rosechu decide to join the fight and fight for good. Sonichu is still chasing after Rosechu and decapitates a Transformer. Chris puts a note about a guy named Timmy in here. Timmy was a YouTuber who made a fan video about Sonichu that Chris liked, but he took issue with the dialogue. So here he's telling Timmy to redo the video with the proper dialogue. Chris has the Transformer say, Ow, my axles, a reference to his Family Guy skit, and he wonders if Seth MacFarlane stole his Ghostbuster sketch for an actual episode of Family Guy. This is Chris's sketch, where Peter needs to find a toilet and finds a ghost machine. And this is Family Guy, where Mort needs to find a toilet and finds a time machine. Oh, I hope there's another bathroom in here. Oh, God. Oh, thank God, a porta potty. It's probably just a coincidence. Magichan tells Sonichu he'll be aided once he arrives with a slam dunk and a slice, obviously referring to Bionic and... I'm not sure who the slice is. Then a new Sonichu shows up. I be a Chandler. He's here to stop Sonichu. He is clearly based on the appearance of Liquid Chris, who usually wore a brown striped shirt. Liquid Chris was this kid who was very good at Chris Chan impressions, and Chris called him an imposter. People began to pretend that he was the real Chris, dubbing him Liquid Chris and Chris Solid Chris after Metal Gear Solid. And Chris was really pissed about the whole situation. Y'all already know me of the cre as the creator of the Sanchu franchise and comics, and uh, the uh, the Roastchu comic uh, as well. This Sanchu is supposed to represent Liquid Chris. Sanchu defeats him with an iron tail, and he transforms back into a human. Sanchu notes that Liquid Chris's medallion was paper thin. A comment on how Liquid Chris's fake Sonichu medallion was made of paper, compared to Chris's which is made of Crayola model magic. Sonichu finally catches up to Rosechu and finds Giovanni, Nate Cirque, and Robotnik in the park. He asks where Rosechu is, even though she's right in front of him. Giovanni makes a demand for Sonichu to make Nate Cirque the mayor of Quickville. What's more important, your city or your sweetheart? But before Sonichu can respond, Bionic hits Giovanni with a basketball from off-screen. The Transformer's arm is sliced off with a blow from Darkbind, and Rosie begins to fall. Sonichu catches her and tries to wake her up. She wakes up, confused, and Bionic and Darkbind come over to help. Nate Cirque gets up and throws a Pokeball at Bionic. It hits him in the head the same way Bionic had hit Nate Cirque earlier in the school with a basketball. The Pokeball releases a Nidoking, and a fight begins. Nidoking forces the Hedgehog backwards, and Sonichu steps in and kicks mud in the Pokemon's face. This hurts it, and Nate Cirque curses. Bionic then kicks Nidoking in the balls, and he faints, and Natesirk recalls him to his Pokeball. Natesirk then does his own energy attack, and launches it at the hedgehogs. This is a version of the Kursehameha, but instead of bad luck, it curses someone with embarrassment. Bionic catches the attack, and does tricks with it like it's a basketball, then tosses it back at Natesirk. He immediately soils himself, and then teleports himself away in embarrassment. We cut back to Magichan and Silvano's duel, where Magichan has already won. He calls Sonichu back to the mall. 
At the park, Mega Gee is cheering on Bionic, using a cheer from Chris's actual high school basketball team, the Lancers. On their way, Magichan explains what they've missed. Ivy was in an elevator of the mall, and the tremors in the ground from the battle raging outside caused the floor to collapse, and she got her neck tangled in the cable. Billy Mays tried to save her, but she died anyway. In real life, Chris was led to believe that the real Ivy had died too. He dedicates this page to her, Ivy O'Neill, which he spells wrong. Sonichu and Rose Chu arrive at the mall at the same time as Mary Lee Walsh, who does her spell to take down the mall's protective shield. Sonichu then takes off and snatches Walsh's broom from underneath her, and he does a what's up doc joke. Walsh then pulls a wild e coyote, and realizes that Sonichu's taken her broom. She looks down and then falls. Count Grajoan slows her fall and makes a floor for her to stand on in midair. Then we get a nice view of Rosie's backside as she watches the action from the ground. As you wish, mouse. I am a hedgehog, not a sand shrew. Yes, because when I think of Pokemon and Mouse, I think of Sandshrew, not, not that other one. Walsh sends some attacks at Sonichu, who dodges them all, and he hits her, and she almost falls off the floating floor. Grajuan thinks to himself that Walsh has done nothing to try to resurrect him, and isn't very powerful, so he decides to let her fall to her death, but Sonichu reaches down and saves her. Walsh then teleports away, and Grajuan thinks that she'll die soon enough. Rosie asks Sonichu why he saved Walsh, and he says that as a hero, he had to. Also, Christian gets to kill her, which does not sound very heroic to me. Then we finally get to see Rose Chu and Sonic Chu's children, and they are overwhelmingly creepy. Epilogue Wild and Magichan spot the time portal opening up and save Chris. There's a 15 minute time skip for some reason, where the story skips over a scene that we'll see in the next issue. Then Chris tells them to meet him in Tennessee, which the reader should remember is the home of Four Cent Garbage. The issue ends on page 100, as Chris Chan, in a Sonichu form, promises the audience that soon he will separate his real-life stories from the stories of Sonichu. This is a lie, but before that, I'm just warning you, it's going to get very graphic. Chris also gives names to Sonichu's children, Sarah, Christine, and Robbie, because we really needed another Sarah, although this one is spelled differently. Christine is also obviously the female version of Chris, which will get confusing when Chris becomes transgender and goes by the name Christine. And Robbie is a version of Chris's father's name, Robert. Chris is clearly not very creative when it comes to making names, despite coming up with all of this nonsense. Thank you to my patrons, A Humble Narcissist, Angel, Blue, Elijah, Evan, Greedy, Hunter, Hypercube Labs, Jose, Joseph, Poe, Randy, Sebastian, Shadow Nexa, Snotling, Steve, and Yellow Fever. Hey Ivy, I'm doing this video for you. Oh, we are going to have so much fun together when you and I are together. Hmm. You know, my mommy and I, my my family and I will come and meet you at the airport. And you know, your choice will take you to your hotel or uh, bring you back to my house. Hmm. I mean, uh, you know, we'd be hanging around so much and sharing so many fondful memories. And, you know, we can enjoy a movie in the theater or at home or watch a television rerun. <laughs> Family guy! <laughs> Family guy! And, you know, I look, you know, I look forward to the eventuality of uh, you and me having our sex time together. <laughs> I'll do you so many... I'll, I'll do my best to pleasure you and keep you satisfied. This is Ivy. Just for you. Just for you. Hmm. Being the good boy just for you, Ivy. I love you so much. I love you so much. <laughs> it's a jolly holiday with Ivy. Ivy makes my heart so light. When the skies are gray and ordinary, Ivy makes the sun shine bright. Oh, happiness is blooming all around her. The daffodils are smiling at the dove. When Ivy holds my hand, I feel so grand. My heart starts beating like a big brass band. Mm. 
I love you so much, Ivy. I love you. I love you. Mm. Talk to you later, sweetheart.